Hello, Dr. Adlam. Really lovely to see you. Thank you for joining us for the FM Day information update. Um, we have some questions specifically about SCAD and FMD, and we hope that you can answer them. And there will be questions that people will be putting in the chat, which, as this is a recorded discussion, we'll be sending those out to you afterwards, hopefully for you to respond. Thank you. So the first question, do you know how many SCAD patients in the UK also have FMD? So I would probably just take a half a step back and talk about the relationship between SCAD and FMD, if you like. What we know is that a proportion of patients who have SCAD, that's spontaneous coronary artery dissection, and I'm guessing you'll have some patients who have FMD and not SCAD in your audience. So just to explain that that's a, a cause of, of heart attacks um, in some people. Um, so a proportion of patients who have SCAD will have variations and abnormalities of the arteries elsewhere in the body. Um, one of the uh, types of abnormalities that's seen is um, uh, looks very like what we've seen in other patients who have FMD, fibromuscular dysplasia. And that's where we see on the, uh, usually on the imaging investigations, the MR or CT scan, that the artery looks like it, it has a series of dilations and narrowings in sequence. And people say that that looks like a, a string of beads. So that is one manifestation of the um, arterial variations and abnormalities that we see in scan patients. It's not the only one. Sometimes we see a focal narrowing. Sometimes I say just the point narrowing rather than the string of beads. Sometimes we see a just dilation of the arteries. That can um, either be a, an aneurysm if it's very localized, or we sometimes call it ectasia if it's a more, over a longer segment of the arteries. So these, all these things have different names. But I think it's important to understand that the uh, things that we see in patients who have SCAD, there's a, there's a spectrum of different things. So I almost prefer to call them SCAD-associated arteriopathies, meaning opathy, just um, something that's wrong with the artery, rather than uh, uh, calling them FMD. So I think sometimes we can get confused that FMD is the string of beads, but so some patients will say, but I've got a little aneurysm or I've got a focal narrowing. Does, does that mean I've got FMD? Well, technically speaking, you haven't got a string of beads, but you've obviously got the same thing in that you've got an arterial variation or an abnormality. Um, uh, in association with SCAD. So how common are these things? Well, it can be a bit confusing when you look at the medical literature, and that's partly because it depends on how hard you look and, and with what tools you look. So if you um, uh, screen all patients who have, have SCAD from head to um, hip, uh, and you look uh, to see if you can find FMD or some of these other variations and abnormalities, it then depends on where, you know, essentially what you're labeling as FMD, which is why I went back to describe those things, because I think sometimes there's a tendency to call any variation FMD. So if there's a bit of tortuosity, you might call it FMD. Tortuosity is just where the arteries are a bit more curly. So it all depends on exactly how what people are using as their terms for FMD. Um, if you look at these things blinded, and this is um, not some sort of you know, violent way of doing image analysis, it's, uh, it's a, a way in which you um, introduce other scans and you don't tell the person who's looking at the scan who's scanned and who's a normal, normal patient. And then you ask the question, um, it's probably at least a third of patients that have something um, in this area of abnormality in scanned patients. Uh, it may be a little more if you use higher resolution imaging techniques. But again, if you think about when you're using the higher resolution imaging techniques, what you're tending to see is more subtle abnormalities. So this is why it's confusing. I think perhaps the more important question is what proportion of patients who have SCAD and have a SCAD-associated arteriopathy, including the thing that looks like FMD, what proportion of those patients have a problem that's related 
it, 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 that arises as a consequence of that. So some sort of vascular event, a stroke or a bleed or a something, you know, that you wouldn't want to have. And I think it's important to say to patients with SCAD that those things seem to be incredibly rare. So whatever these abnormalities are that we find in patients, actually bad things arising as a consequence of those findings seems to be very unusual in patients who present first with SCAD, as opposed to patients who present first with their FMD and maybe then subsequently have SCAD, but the FMD is the thing that they present with first. Patients whose first presentation is, is with SCAD who have these things found on investigations and tests, bad things arising as a consequence of those things is uncommon. But we do sometimes find things that we need to keep an eye on, particularly those little aneurysms where we, you know, depending on how big they are or where they are and all of those kind of things, we might want to keep patients under surveillance. So in summary, this is a long answer to your question. In summary, it's quite common to find something, but actually a lot of those somethings don't really make much difference to the patient. In terms of the important things that actually, you know, we need to keep an eye on or do something about, those things are uncommon. Thank you. Thank you. I think that uh, that makes a, a lot of sense. And that sort of really leads me to a second question, which is um, uh, for a lot of the SCAD patients from way back when we first started as a support group and we got involved in that early research, um, knowledge about FND was a lot less than it is now. And so uh, for, for a lot of us that were scanned back then in 2013-14, uh, we're wondering whether um, whether FND was actually spotted at that time or whether this is something perhaps that uh, that we need to think about getting rescanned. What would you say about that? Yes, so in SCAD research and to some extent in FMD research and SCAD FMD as well, like kind of there's three different entities, there are some things that we know and some things that, you know, we'd like to learn more about. From what we know at the moment, patients with FMD uh, in the context of SCAD, so patients who've had SCAD and then are found to have FMD, as I've mentioned to you, the FMD that we find doesn't seem to cause patients problems on the whole. Uh, it, you know, it's very uncommon for anything really to arise as a consequence of it. It's almost a marker of somebody who's had SCAD rather than a problem, if that makes sense. We don't at the moment recommend repeat imaging. That's because, again, some the research that has been done suggests that these things don't change a great deal. However, there hasn't been a lot of research in FMD in the context of SCAD. So it's something that, you know, we are kind of actively planning to do to actually invite back some of those very early patients, both um, that had normal scans to see if normal changes, um, but also um, those that had, you know, these variations um, and, uh, and abnormalities that we've been talking about to see if there is any change over time. My expectation is that there won't be, because again, what we see in these patients and even those patients that we've um, come across who had their scans many, many years ago, you know, we are not seeing lots of these patients who are having vascular events. And yet we know, as I've said, that probably a third to a half of those patients have some variation or abnormality of the arteries. So as I've said, it seems to be uncommon in patients who present first with SCAD and then have something found that that thing causes a problem going on forwards. Okay, thank you. That's, uh, that's helpful. So moving on to treatment and management, is it different for SCAD patients who then <clears throat> are also diagnosed with FMD? Or do all SCADs all get treated the, the same regardless of whether they have FMD? Yeah, so this, this is an area of uncertainty. And it's an area where there are some uh, clinical trials that are just starting that may give us a bit more information over time. But this is going to take a, a while for us to answer as a, um, you know, as, as a, uh, a patient clinical um, team, if you like. Um, so 
at the moment, I do manage patients slightly differently in this context. So if patients have SCAD and don't have stents, so we say this is conservatively managed, and um, they don't have a big scar on the heart, so the heart's still doing pretty well, and they don't have a lot of abnormalities of the arteries elsewhere, particularly a lot of FMD, um, then we would often think about stopping the antiplatelet therapies. These are aspirin and aspirin-like drugs. Um, in some patients who have more in the way of FMD, particularly in the head and neck arteries, these are patients that in the context of things that we know about FMD, we would tend to have treated them with an aspirin-like drug over time. A lot of this is theoretical. It's not clinical trial based. It's not really been shown that doing that makes patients better, but it, it, it's something, if you like, that if the sort of consensus of people who look after patients like this, that we feel that that's perhaps the right thing to do. We'd love to be able to move forward from, if you like, you know, consensus of international brains of people looking after patients to actual data to be able to say whether what I'm doing here in terms of antiplatelet treatments for patients who have scadden FMD and patients who have scadden don't have FMD is correct or not. Some of these clinical trials are beginning that will start to inform us about some of these questions, but they'll, you know, the, the, the sort of uh, the answers are probably still some years away. Okay, thank you. Um, um, can you tell us where are those studies are being undertaken, just out of interest? So there's a study that started in Spain under Professor Alfonso, um, and what they are doing is taking patients with SCAD and um, assigning them to a higher intensity antiplatelet um, uh, um, treatment and a lower intensity antiplatelet treatment. And also they're doing a similar thing with beta blockers. So they're uh, either prescribing or not prescribing it. So it's a clinical trial. It's a first trial of a clinical trial. And I think they're doing incredibly well. Um, uh, so, you know, that's not going to answer all of the questions, but it's going to give a start. There's also another international grouping um, at the moment um, that is trying to sort of build an international, a large international collaborative to answer a similar question. And again, sometimes it's worth having more than one clinical trial to build slightly different nuances and understanding about these questions. So these are things which are actively either, either started as in the Spanish study or seeking funding as in the other international study that I mentioned. Yeah, but that's really good news. Um, we'll look forward to I hearing think it's more. really good news that we're starting to dip our toe into mm. clinical trials. That's what we need to do to be able to, you know, move from where we've been at with research in SCAD and FMD to actually data to us to, to be able to kind of make decisions rather than, you know, doing it on the basis of opinion. Mm. Mm. Yes, well, I can understand that. So it leads on to a, another question that a lot of people ask, and that is, does having FMD increase the risk of having recurrent SCAD? So I think there is some data to suggest that is the case. I think what we have to remember here, first of all, is that there are some things here that we are still learning about. So for example, how common is recurrent SCAD? Now we know that SCAD recurrences occur. And um, you know, if we go back to the original, you know, those seminal um, works that were produced by our um, friends and colleagues at the Mayo Clinic uh, and our friends and partners in Vancouver, who really began this process of trying to gather together patients with SCAD to understand more about those patients. If you look at those very early studies, you can get an impression that recurrent SCAD is perhaps more common than we now think it to be. Now, the reason for that is that in the early days, the SCADs that we were picking up were the ones that were really unequivocal, the ones that were kind of, oh my goodness, this is a SCAD, you know, and those patients perhaps had a more severe presentation. And maybe those types of patients were more likely to have a recurrence um, it, during follow-up. Also, I guess back then patients, you know, they were a bit more 
um, potentially a bit more historical. So they might have had their scan a few years ago, so they've had longer in terms of follow up as well. Recent data produced um, again by the uh, Canadian group um, in Vancouver has suggested that recurrences, if you like, in a more sort of typical population of scant that's out there in the population rather than those perhaps more selected patients that we were looking at first of all, may be a little bit less common, maybe somewhere around 1% a year, something like that, of patients that has a recurrence so 10% over 10 years. So we're still learning a bit about that. And in that context, I think we still have a way to go to be really clear on understanding what increases the risk of recurrence, what reduces the risk of recurrence, you know, both in terms of medical treatments and also markers. In terms of the does FMD increase my risk of recurrence question, I think it's also a little bit around how useful that is. <laughs> so we're probably talking about a small risk. And if, and as, as I've said, there may be some uncertainty around, around this, but if FMD increases that risk, it's increasing it from a small amount to something that's still quite a small amount. You'll still be more likely not to have a recurrence than you will to have a recurrence. If you to mean. And so I think it's important to emphasize that because otherwise, if you have scan and FMD, we've already said maybe nearly half of patients will. I don't want half of patients to be sitting you know, worried that somehow their risk is very high. You know, there may be all sorts of things that slightly alter risk. Um, but I think the most important message is that yes, scad recurrences can occur. It's important if you get those tip very typical symptoms, and it's usually unequivocal, that you go to a place of safety to be looked after, and uh, you know, just during that acute phase. So all of those things re remain important. But equally, you don't want to be sitting waiting for a recurrence for 10 years, not to have one, and then you've wasted 10 years when you could have been, you know, out enjoying life. And so, yes, you know, recurrence is something to have in the back of your mind uh, somewhere right, way back here so that you react appropriately in the event that it happens, but equally not to become so big that it dominates, you know, how you live life, if that makes sense. So. I, I probably wouldn't be overly focused on that um, um, perspective. I think, you know, those kind of things are quite useful for us that are doing research because they maybe just give us little hints as to how this thing works. But I'm not sure it's so useful at a patient perspective because I think it just has the potential to make people more worried. Okay, thank you. Yes, I understand that. Um, so the... Uh... The next question is actually a bit about some of those people that had a SCAD, were diagnosed with FMD and told that they had an aneurysm. Um, how concerned should, what is an exam? It would be really useful for you to explain what an aneurysm is. Is it the same, but in different different parts of the, the body, different arteries? And, and how concerned should SCAD patients be about being diagnosed with an aneurysm? So probably around about one in 10 patients with SCAD will have an aneurysm somewhere. In terms of what it is, it's a localized dilation of the artery. So you get a normal segment, you get a little thing that looks like a sort of a, an area of dilation, a little swelling of the artery, and then a norm, it goes back to a normal segment. And I mentioned the word ectasia earlier, just to explain that in case patients have that on their reports or letters. Ectasia tends to be where it where the artery is broader over a longer segment, so it's a sort of a it's a it's di dilated but over a longer segment rather than a very focal thing. So should should I be worried about an aneurysm? Again, I come back to what I said at the very beginning, which is that in SCAD patients as a whole, whether they have FMD, whether they have aneurysms, whether they have dissections in other arteries, whether they have tortuous arteries, all of these different things that we sometimes find. The incidence or the number of patients that have vascular events seems to be very tiny indeed, regardless of all of those things. There are um, some patients who have aneurysms. I think it is uncommon, not, not, um, it's not zero, but it's uncommon for those aneurysms to be at the size at which we would be thinking about whether or not we should be doing something. So 
there are we find all sorts of things in SCAD because we're looking some of them are very tiny you know they are a millimeter or a couple of millimeters or something like that and those very tiny things are not so important um sometimes we will find things which are um bigger and obviously how big it is depends on where it is so if you've got a really big artery and you know it might be that it's you know let's say you've got a I don't know, an eight millimeter artery and it's got a focal dilation to 10 millimeters. That's very different. So if you've got a one millimeter artery that's got a focal dilation to 10 millimeters, does that make sense? So the, again, the size depends a little bit on where you're looking at. Um, but I think, again, my experience for the most part is that there are some of these aneurysms and dilations that we keep an eye on. And that's, if you like, my job or the job of your cardiologist locally to keep an eye on things for you so that you don't need to worry about it, to do occasional bits of imaging to make sure that it doesn't change. I have to say that my experience is that these things don't seem to change a lot uh, in the patients that you know we look after and we have under surveillance. So yes, we find those things. They are quite uncommonly of the size at which we're, you know, you know, we would be thinking about whether or not to do anything. Um, and um, but there are some that we want to keep an eye on. The other thing is just occasionally we may find a distribution of things with the arteries that makes us just think about whether or not there could be another related condition going on. These are the connective tissue disorders that sometimes people talk about. So sometimes your doctor or we may say, look, OK, we've got a little as well as you're scared or whatever. You, maybe you've got an aneurysm here and a little dissection there. And just that's a little bit of an unusual combination. And we might in that context say, let's pop and see a geneticist. Again, I have to say that the yield seems to be very low. We already know that from the genetic studies, that the frequency of these genetic disorders in scan patients is very tiny, three, three and a half percent. So, you know, 96 and a half percent, a bit of rapid maths, wasn't it? Um, <laughs> and, uh, so again, you know, if you like, it's for us to just help you through that process. If we think a referral is a good idea, then we'll do those things. But if you have an aneurysm, our experience is those things seem to remain very stable over time in scanned patients. We don't see problems arising from them. It's incredibly uncommon for us to want to do anything about them. But we do, you know, we want to look after you and make sure everything's OK. And so sometimes we might say, look, have a scan in a year or have a scan in three years just to check that things haven't changed. OK, thank you. That's really helpful, I think. Um, I'm sure what you've said is going to generate other questions. And as I said at the beginning, we'll collate those questions and I'll be emailing you with them. Um, so I'd be grateful if you could take a look at those and we can share some answers back in the in the group afterwards. Um, thank you very much for joining us. No worries we at all. Really yeah. Sorry, I can't join it. you in person this time and I hope you have a a lovely evening. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Hope you have a lovely evening. Thank you.